that point if now I did lose my job, but I reapplied for another one. I'm still at the same agency. I picked up a lot of freelance writing. Now I have two kids, you know, so life has gotten quite hectic and I keep getting asked, when are you writing the second one? And I'm like, oh, I'm working on it one day. <laughs> But here I am. Well, I think it's probably the next time you go on vacation. So. Yes, it must be. Well, <laughs> yeah, wherever you go on vacation, that could be the next book. Right. And just for the record, where are you from? I'm originally from Grand Bay, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> just for the tape. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. That's my story. So. Well, why don't you give, give people at least a sentence or two on, on the heroine? And she has supernatural... I know I'm the only one who read it, so I, I, I definitely <laughs> read it. Oh, <laughs> Megan, of course, Megan. Yeah, you probably we, we read it also. For the uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we represent here, okay. But she has supernatural powers. Well, she doesn't know it. She's 16, and she's about to turn 17, and she's traveled all over the place with her mom, who is an artist, and she's never met her dad. And when she's 16, her mom says, you know what, we're about to move again. And she's like, not again. You're always making me move. I always have to go somewhere else. And she said, well, actually, we're not moving. You're moving. You're moving to New Orleans to live with your aunt. And she said, what, you're sending me away? I'm not going to be with you anymore. And it turns out it was a promise that she had made to Eva's father when she was a baby that when she was 16, she would send her back to New Orleans to live here. And Eva doesn't know anything about this. She doesn't even know that her father's alive. Her father is alive, and he has a friend named Jackson who he sends to meet Eva and kind of lead her along and teach her about this world that she is supposedly destined to become the leader of. So it's a world of immortal people who live in New Orleans amongst all the regular people at the same time. It could be any of you, we just don't, don't know. Yes. <laughs> they all mingle together, and you would have no idea. And New Orleans is the perfect setting for that, right? Because of all kinds of people here. So, I had ideas of going on and going further into more books and having Eva have many more adventures. So, hopefully, I will be able to write those cool. in the future. So. Fascinating. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. I have one more question, uh, Jeffrey. So, you self published on Kindle, mm -hmm. but these are hard, hard copies. They are. So, Amazon has a sister company called Create Space. And they are also free to publish. They don't uh, keep stock. They only do it until people order them. On so, demand. Yes. So I can order them myself and then put them, like, I had asked you if you would sell them here. I have them next door. It, it takes a lot more work than, you know, you don't have an agent. You don't have a publisher putting them in places for you. So I would have to go to every bookstore and get them to. And I did find out that um, Megan had actually asked at Barnes & Noble for me. And they won't sell them because Create Space is there. Enemy, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, they have milk, and I mean, it's a whole complicated thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. So but the book publishing industry is different, and we have some people who are involved in self-publishing, whatever here. So it would be interesting. Oh, to, nice. Let's hear about uh, a whole different world. Which is, <laughs> but we're celebrating our own. That's the theme. And Jeffrey, so talk to us. Well, um, my name is Jeffrey Beaker, and I am the owner and founder of French Truck Coffee. And you may have seen my little. Um, Citroen Doshobo tooling around uh, New Orleans, and uh, that really is what it looks like when it's going down the road. It looks like it's tooling. Um, I um, rose coffee, and hopefully, um, I've fueled some literary um, works along the way. Um, my background is as a chef and a culinarian, and um, about, I guess, nine years ago, um, I had a little girl. And that little girl didn't want to have a dad that got home at 2 in the morning. And so I transitioned out of the um, restaurant world that I was in um, and became a stay-at-home dad. And while I was a stay-at-home dad, I had a cousin who was working in California at a restaurant called Chez Panisse that is world famous. And she was tired of the grind and wanted to come visit. And we had moved away um, just before Katrina and we're living in the Virgin Islands, and she picked up a bag of coffee from a company in San Francisco and came to uh, visit us for the summer. And we took that bag of coffee and we ground it up, and it was the best cup of coffee I'd ever had in my life. And I didn't understand why I had never had coffee that nice before. 
And so I started doing research on the company and found out that the guy who had founded it had no culinary background, he had no roasting background. He just figured out something that America has long forgotten about coffee because it has become so mechanized, and that is that the fresher the coffee is from the roaster, the better it's going to taste. Um, and I tell people in New Orleans, I, people say, hey, of all the cities, why in the world would you go, to visit, go into business in New Orleans? And it's pretty simple. Most of the roasters in New Orleans have factories. I have a shop. Um, Wade and Z have come to visit me. It is nothing glamorous. It's a warehouse, and I've got two little roasters in it that plug away. And the big difference between what I do and what most of the coffee in New Orleans is, if I roast it and I take it to the people that ordered it. I don't have shelves and shelves of coffee and hope that it gets ordered. I wait till somebody picks up the phone and calls me and says, I need, and then I fire up the roaster. Um, and hopefully you can taste the difference in the new espresso that I came up with for Wade and Z. They came to me and said, we'd love to use you, but we've already got a roaster. Uh, but we've got a, a challenge for you, and if you can meet the challenge, we'll start buying it from you. And the challenge was to come up with a fair trade, organic espresso. And that is a challenge for a very simple reason. 90% of the espresso blends in this, that are consumed in this country contain beans from Brazil um, that help create the crema, or the Guinness part of the espresso shop. Um, and the way they do that is there are two different ways that beans are, are handled. One is a wash process where the beans, the outside cherry, the red part. Now we're going to get in the weeds. Oh, okay. <laughs> is washed off using water and um, a fermentation process. And there's a dry process that waits for that cherry to dry and then um, hulls it off. That's what you need to make the crema because you need that little bit of natural um, mucilage left on the bean to make the crema. Okay, now we've got the technical part out of the way. Brazil does not play fair trade or organic. There's very little of their coffee is considered, is certified organic, and even less is fair trade. So that eliminates the primary bean that you need to make true espresso. So I did something that as a roaster you're not supposed to do, and that is you combine two big flavor beans. So we found a fair trade organic Sumatran, which is a natural process which gives you the crema, and we found a fair trade organic Colombian, which are usually two beans that stand on their own with some Brazilian in the background to help make the crema. And so we put those two together and tasted them, and they tasted fantastic, which is contrary to everything. everything that is not good. what you're supposed to do with espresso. You're not supposed to take two big flavor beans and put them together. And we did, and it tasted good, because I was up to the challenge of finding this, but I didn't want to start serving something, and everybody went, oh, where'd you get this, French truck? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had it tonight, and I gotta say, I, I'm really thrilled with how it is turning out because we've done some Well, it's also got a good crema. Yes, it does. Which yeah. is not supposed to happen at all, and which everybody we've talked to says was not possible. Right. 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 So we did it, and it, that's pretty exciting. I'm really happy to be here, and thanks for having me come. And it's, uh, it's really neat to see it in action because this was the first time since we made all our tweaks to machinery that I've come and actually had it had it in the shop, and it's fantastic. Well, and Z's probably asked a lot of people. I come here when I'm in town, either Saturdays or Sundays, and do my hour or two, and just, you know, my own focus group of, you know, I work in the I brought the bathroom here. <laughs> um, but I asked people who were getting the espresso how they liked it, since I knew it was new, and they didn't know, and people have loved it. Uh, that's what it. they're telling me, and then I'd say, Hey, you know, we're finally 100% fair trade. This is new. You know, you know, seriously, it's, oh, well, yeah. And I think the response has been good, yeah. Absolutely. Our, our hardest critics are always the baristas behind the counter. Before anyone else got a taste of it, they had to okay it. And they all loved it. So we were, we were a go. Yeah, which is opposite most businesses where <laughs> you actually pay somebody and therefore they tell you what you want to hear. Uh, Not this business. This particular <laughs> business, you, you hire a team of critics that yes. happen to occasionally, you know, do what you're begging them to do. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, but I think it's been good. And Much like running a kitchen, actually. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's all, 
culinarian. I, I like that. Maybe we should put that in some dictionary. Um, but it's, uh, you know, if we had a daily paper, this would probably be headline news. We don't have that, so uh, we, we wanted uh, Jeffrey to come. And we're going to have to figure out a way one of these times to do a tasting or something. And, uh, yeah, tell us about the, the uh, citrion. Um, it was uh, it was born in 1975. Uh, it did most of its life in Bordeaux as a work truck. Damn. Um, yeah. <laughs> Look at that gig. <laughs> um, and then it was um, imported to New Jersey, where there's a gentleman who does full restorations of citron products. Yeah, it was just written up in New York Times or something. Uh, Noel Slade. Uh, I sure believe so. Yeah, he's in Toms River, New Jersey, and yeah. got really yeah. wiped out by Sandy. Yeah, same, same guy. Um, yeah, okay. So he's moved to a new garage, and, and that's fantastic. But that, that particular truck had the entire body removed, the engine, everything. It's got a brand new frame. Um, it's going to have a brand new clutch this week. <laughs> uh, but it gets 55 miles to, gallon, to the gallon because it is a two cylinder 600cc engine. Well, two cylinder? Mm -hmm. so, that's that's like a so it's a, motor, <laughs> it's a motorcycle with, with a, a truck on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pretty much. Um, it will go 70 miles an hour. I have been on I-10 with it, and it <laughs> is it terrifying? <laughs> I think I think it's less terrifying because you get this bubble of cars around you. Trying to take <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of protected on all sides. No, I, I, I actually rode by you going to work the other day, and I was on my bike taller than your car. <laughs> And uh, Z has probably met him. I don't know if Wade has, but Max is my only employee, and Max is my size as well. So each of us looks very ridiculous. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> A clown car. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had. I've use. actually never seen the truck at, in operation. I'm oh no, it's, it's amazing. It really exists. Mm -hmm. It's right? fifty-five okay. miles an hour, a foot, miles a gallon. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Wow. Yeah, so it's got a five-gallon tank, and the first time I heard it had a five-gallon tank. We don't fill that thing up but once a week and work wow. around the city nonstop. Right. And it's perfect for that is a two cylinders like a motorcycle. Yeah. So, I mean, you're and it's perfect for deliveries because we can tuck into little tiny spots. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Cars like can't fit in. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And then it happens in the French Quarter all the time. If we're in the French Quarter making a delivery because we do home deliveries as well, um, is if we get into a place where we've got a somebody coming around giving tickets, we're usually back in time by the time the ticket lady has figured out what to do with this truck that she does. What is this? Don't worry about it, I'll get it out of the way. <laughs> so, it's never gotten a ticket. Um, I have been pulled over once by a policeman who thought it was ridiculous that it was on the streets. Um, but it has an inspection sticker. If they ever tell you to put it in a bicycle lane, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's a problem. It would fit. But we get some other coffee now from uh, Jeff. Don't we? Yeah, we're gonna get our 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 fair trade espresso and um, a delicious decaf. It's the best decaf coffee I've ever had in my life. I didn't even know it was a real thing. Yeah. Um, and then everything available um, for our French presses. And right now we've got a really nice Colombian, and we just got a Sumatran. Um, mm -hmm. If you wanna, you sent me an amazing description of that earlier today. If you wanna talk about it. Yeah, it's, um, it's actually the same bean that blends in with the espresso. Oh, okay. Um, and it's kind of wild and earthy. It's um, not of coffee flavor that um, people who really love Colombian, that kind of middle of the road flavor, will recognize because it's, it's, it's jungly. And it, it, it really tastes tropical. You can tell that it is a tropical fruit. Um, and it's, you'll, you'll okay. enjoy it. Wait okay. till tomorrow though, because French press it, it'll bubble too much. Okay. It was roasted this morning. Gotcha. Do you want to talk at all about um, getting the beans in through the port? Yeah, um, one of the things that's really interesting about the coffee industry is the beans go where the money is. Um, so, fair trade beans tend to be more expensive for a roaster. For me as a roaster, because I only get 10 bags at a time of five different coffees, um, it's pretty difficult to steer coffee, which is what it's termed in the industry of where it's going to be ported. Um, <clears throat> but the interesting thing about New Orleans is because of its proximity to the Midwest and Chicago and Cincinnati and Memphis and Nashville and all the other major metropolitans north of us, a lot of coffee comes through New Orleans, but it usually stops here and gets loaded on a truck and keeps going. Um, and it doesn't stop here for very long. 
I have worked with a couple different green brokers, and a green broker is the person who travels like Wade travels. Goes all over to these different small third world countries and finds the farmers or the co-ops that they're going to buy beans from. I work with them because I two people. My company is two people and I've got a truck to drive so I can't go traveling as much as Wade does. Um, so I don't have the opportunity to go to these farms and so I have two different companies, and actually two gentlemen, that I trust to find things that I would like. They send me samples and then decide based on what I like, what Coast Gross likes, what different roasters in this area like, what will go where. If and they're based? One's in Houston. Okay. One is based here, uh, but most of their warehousing is in, on the two coasts, but they do have warehouse space here. Um, and usually their warehouse space is drop it, container it, and keep it moving. Okay. Is it, so, is it sold? Is it sold as in like you pay for it as it's leaving whatever, wherever it's coming from, or does it get here and then get sold at auction, or? There is no auction in coffee. Um, it's mostly contracts. So okay. what, I, I was actually working on this today, and the way it works is I find coffee that I like and I project what I'm going to use over the next three months. So you buy it on contract in advance from the right. I, don't, I don't front the money, but I promise I'm going to buy it. Right. And that's based on a fluctuating um, number that is different every day. Right. That's a commodity stock price. Yeah. 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 I'm a commodity. Yeah. Yeah. And and then, fair trade is a premium above right. the New York yeah. market rate. Exactly. And the New York market rate is for the farmed, cultivated, machine processed Brazilian, basically. Right. It's the bottom barrel right. number. And then every coffee that you probably drink, unless you go and slum it and do community from time to time, is a different number above that. Right. And fair trade, some of the um, smaller parcels, such as Jamaica, or Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, those are much higher just because they're such yeah, small so lots. Small, not land. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. So Ethiopians are higher because they've got further to come. Cheaper is Mexico, even though it's just as high quality as some of the further afar field coffees. But you're because only it's shipping it. There. Right, you're only shipping it from Mexico to New Orleans instead of from no, Ethiopia no, 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 to Brazil right. to New Orleans. Okay. Um, and so when I start talking to them, I have to talk way out in the future. So when they first came to me and said, can you do this? I said, I'll try. Right. So what happened was that the, the, the linchpin to the whole thing was that Indonesian. And the Indonesian, they took a chop of it, which is what they call it, and it can be anywhere from 10 bags to a container. Coming out of Indonesia, ended up tucked into a container that was coming to the, to the Port of New Orleans instead of going to Houston or Seattle right. or Florida or wherever it was going to, it was headed. Um, and that takes... It ship, for Houston, it ships in through Galveston or like no, Port no, Orange or... Houston, Houston is a port, so Port of Houston gets... Right on the ship channel. Okay, ship channel through Port exactly. Orange. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and there's a lot of coffee importation that happens through Houston. Well, We're still the second largest port after New York, but Houston's catching up. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I didn't know that there was that much going up that ship channel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we would. There, I'm, I'm sure Wade has got more information about this, but we would be bigger than Houston by large. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Some but Houston has taken a lot from us. Yeah, because of the rail lines. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so long story short, and because they they've actually tried to go after the coffee market. I mean, it's yeah. unclear if the port. So, you know, we're getting way up off the... Yeah. It's unclear that Port of New Orleans is doing what it needs to do to, to bring coffee, particularly after Katrina. Yeah. Well, and then we also have silo calf here. And silo calf, you buy rail cars full of yeah. coffee, not 150-pound bags, which is right. what I buy. So when they came to me, I had to steer some of that. And I had to kind of get them to... I, I have to do, make a contract. They don't have to make a contract. They can tell me to buy tomorrow. <laughs> so we kind of do it on a gentleman's agreement or a ladies and gentlemen agreement that we're going to do business together and we're going to try to take care of each other. Because um, what I'm working on, 
I have to basically, if they decide that they don't care for my product anymore, I've got to figure out a way to use up the contract that I've made. Right, utilize it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's a, it's a tenuous thing for roasters, and, and that's why another reason why it's been very difficult for them to find this situation, because roasters get burned, sorry the pun, uh, roasters get burned <laughs> all the time by this new hot restaurant that wants their own special blend, and they bring on something into their inventory that is fairly specific, because there are some coffees that have really definitive profiles. Yurgachev from Ethiopia has a lot of lemon in it, and it's really assertive. And it's not a very popular coffee in the general coffee public. Really educated coffee drinkers love it, because it's so different from everything else. But if you buy it, number one, you're paying a premium. Number two, if you don't have somebody that's going to buy it, it'll end up sitting in your warehouse and go bad. And so that's, that's why getting a roaster to do what I'm doing for them is difficult. The last thing, and I'll wipe, wrap up here, is I have two roasters, one that's a 5 kilogram roaster and one that's a 15 kilogram roaster. That sounds like a lot. But the, most of my competitors are on 30 kilos or higher roasters. And what that means is that I've got to get, if I've got a roaster that big, I've got to get 10 people to agree on what they're going to buy from me. As opposed to if you opened up a restaurant and said, I'm only going to buy five pounds a week from you and I want a specialty blend, no problem. I got it. Because you can roast a small amount at a time. I can, yeah. I, I can roast down to three pounds at a time, mm -hmm. efficiently and accurately every single time. And really getting 10 people to agree on our end breaks down to the roaster calling and saying, this is your only option. <laughs> like, we, don't, we don't even get a say. This is what you're going to I mean, the advantage of doing business with us is we drink, we, we buy a lot of coffee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what we do. Um, and because we want to uh, develop more appreciation for a fair trade market, clearly if we have somebody who will play with us, which right. is what Jeffrey's been willing to do, then we want to make a long-term commitment, you know, that uh, lets him go out and lets us go out. And then, the, then the hard part is getting people to care what they're drinking. I mean, uh, we have, we've seen nothing since we've been here, a steady increase in how many people come and how much we sell, but do they really understand, I mean, do they understand the I mean, we're not <coughs> coffee snobs, do they understand 10% of what Jeffrey's talking about? I don't know, you tell me, Chris, but I doubt it. Well, you know. probably not. No, they they know it's not uh, Louisiana, like I used to, you know, drive a lift truck and pull it in, pull it out, and we were doing contracts in the Vietnam War out there on, off Chefman Tour, but... Uh, I mean, people are aware of fair trade, but I mean, as far as I get a little nuance, I mean, some people are, some people are. I now sit back in that, you know, that my office back there, and uh, I hear all kinds of things, you know, and uh, so some people, you know, some people are kind of, you know, picky about it those things, but most people I don't think really, you know, when you go someplace. Well, and you know, decaf is a things. good example. We're very proud of what uh, Jeffrey's done for us on decaf and that we have it, but I don't know if we, we don't sell much decaf in the day. No. Nobody does. Yeah, but, you know, so sometimes. <laughs> but the people that buy it, if we don't have it. I know, we make a commitment, <laughs> we, we strap it up and we, you know, brew it and keep it fresh, but. You know, if we if we sell a full air pod, I'd be surprised every day. I mean, it's a it's a commitment to being a coffee house, and we we're very proud of that decaf. But we could talk all day, and we're like, oh, are, you, are we just talking to ourselves? I guess so. Well, I'll get decaf next time. Well, no, Thank you. No. <laughs> same price, but I mean, you know, the point is the point. Let me throw it open because uh, it's fascinating. Some of what you're talking about in terms of self-publishing and. Uh, my friends over here have actually, we've met many a weekend uh, mm -hmm. when I have my office hours here and talked about, you're involved, you want to tell them about the self-publishing you're involved in? Well, yes, uh, 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 Diana had, had written a book, uh, and, and, and I, I, I had written a book and had a bad experience with a publisher at uh, the University of Michigan. I said, what the hell, you know, this is the new, the new age. So we uh, published our books and actually set up a little a little press, a little mom and pop press called Birds of the Air Press. We've since done three other, uh, three other books. All, you know, there's no money involved at all. It's a, it's a labor of love. Uh, then I, we saw that Wade was, he's got his own little press and selling books. And so we're we're talking about the idea of of uh, 
trying to get some kind of uh, uh, initiative, uh, you know, because probably half the people that walk in this place are sitting on a manuscript, I would, I would guess, you know. And uh, uh, another sitting. This is this is how the conversation goes. Another sitting. I don't know if it's on a manuscript. <laughs> But yeah, um, and you know, it's just it's all kind of open ended at, 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 at this point. But I, you know, I was fascinated to hear both of your both of your stories. Now you've you've gone the, the real commercial route, well, just and, and, which is wonderful. You know, but this is a small. It's a press, small press, right? though, right? It's yeah. A small press, yeah. I mean, this, he told me the fact that like, it was kind of interesting uh, in a good way. I went over to his house early on one day, and I asked him, I said, "Look, I'm, I'm kind of curious. You know, how many?" How many of you sold? How's it going? Because I mean, I didn't want to like ask him because I mean, someone's asking me how much money am I going to get? Not much. <laughs> and, uh, uh, silver dime. And, uh, and silver dime. Yeah, that's about it. Okay. And uh, and he said, well, he said, uh, I've sold seventy. It was out for about a week and a half. And he said, I've sold seventy on Amazon. And I said, okay, I, I don't know what that meant. You know, so, so I know what seventy means, but. And he said, but for what it's worth, he said, I've never sold that many books before on Amazon, or anything I've ever done. I said, okay. And then, uh, then when we started having book signings around town, they kept calling for more books, they kept running out. And by the time I got to the book signings, the, the books were gone. So there were no books. And uh, then, you know, I've been in the community doing this and that, so I kind of have a, I know a few people here and there, and, and, you know, in the paper, and they were, and they were, this piqued their interest when I sent the emails, and so people started kind of contacting me. So I started getting press, you know, I got like, I was on three television shows, I was uh, on a couple of, you know, on radio, radio a couple of times, like mm -hmm. WNO, uh, and then the picky you wrote this Sunday before Christmas big piece about me. It was big love letter, yeah, that was a mash note. It was great, yeah, and then I was also on Stepping Out, uh, but I was, I, they couldn't fit me into stepping out until after Christmas, but when I was there to do the show before Christmas, they talked about my book on the show, because they had the book, Susan Austin was on, she talked about my book that, on that show before Christmas, that was pretty cool. So consequently, we sold out of the books before, four days before Christmas, and since it's published on demand, you know, we couldn't get them in four days. Yeah. So, oh, okay, so that was a publish on demand situation. Well, right. when I say publish on demand, I'm not quite exactly sure that's not my department, he's the one that gets them, but I, right. I think it's kind of like, he, he goes to these people, he has, a, he has a small press, he's had it for a long time, he orders X, but he orders what he wants. So that's publish on demand for him. Yeah, yeah. So, but he can't, he couldn't get them in time. And, and one, one, one guy told me, one bookstore told me, he said, man, he said, I could sell 500 of these things between now and Christmas. And I was like, five days before Christmas, and they weren't any left. Do you know how many he sold at this point? He sold about 1,100, I think. and. Uh, and I, back, now I can sell it myself. And, uh, which you can is, just hold them in, in your head and walk around. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it's true. I, I, get, I get so much more money yeah. if I sell them myself. And, but I, I have to buy them from him. So he, yeah. and, and, which I'm glad that I, I can yeah. do that. So I've sold 450. So we've sold at least 1,500. This, this, whole, this whole field is, is changing uh, you know, so much, and Chrissy did a different, completely different side of it, you know, going through, through Amazon and, and, and e-book sales, which is, which is an amazing thing yeah. when you think about it. I mean, the, the numbers you're getting are, I mean, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. it is. Uh, well, so. and they actually do a lot, I've noticed, like, I'll go look at the book online just to, because I want to see if anyone's left comments or something. And then two days later, I'll get an email from Amazon saying, I saw you were interested in this book. Would you like mm -hmm. to come back and buy it? So that's, probably that's part that of it's creepy, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got an email about her book from Amazon, yeah. just completely randomly. Mm -hmm. I think they track that I live in New Orleans. They're tracking everything. So they, New Orleans. They send out <laughs> an email to yeah. people who regularly buy books from Amazon who live in New Orleans. They actually know you're here right now. <laughs> yeah, we're all well, reading emails on this right now. The, the, the yeah. secret of, of the Amazon logarithm is, is the relational, you know, they match what your taste is in a very fancy logarithm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they don't always get it right, so this was a, an out of plum kind of book for me to order, so to get more suggestions yeah. that I were more adult fantasy books or <laughs> you know not going to be something that picks up but I mean you'll order a travel book and all of a sudden you know if it's about Guatemala or whatever you'll get three or four recommendations I mean I get more email from Amazon than a lot of other people but uh, it's part of the amazing thing about their their business but 
Um, it's fascinating what you say about the the five day Amazon, you know, offering for free thing because yeah. this book Ape A P E Ape I mm -hmm. told you about. Yep. I mean, he recommends heavily this uh, other publisher entrepreneur. I forget the guy. Was a big Google guy, and he was yeah, he's a fun. huge advocate of of uh, artisanal publishing, he calls it, um, you know, I'm not self-publishing. I'd like to ask, the, I, I, I'm gathering that you're the, the manager here, I, I'd kind of like to ask you what, which, what you think about this idea of having some kind of presence here of, of uh, some kind of publishing aspect. I mean, Wade's already doing that, of course. But, right. Uh, but with, with a very specific... Yeah, with a very... Yeah, and, and don't be afraid to say, well, no, I think it's a stupid idea or, or <laughs> what, but uh, do, do you... I mean, my impression is that a lot of people who come here are writers or writing or. Uh... Yeah, I definitely. I like. I think you know a lot of a lot of what Wade experiences when he comes here in the mornings are the, the kind of like neighborhood regulars mm -hmm. that have been coming to this coffee shop you know, for the past fifteen years. Um, but especially at night, like it's nothing but laptops open and people typing, and and some of them are surely working on manuscripts and. Yeah. And you know, even if some maybe, of them are working on term papers. Some of them are working on term papers, but some of those term papers are going to end up being manuscripts in five years. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, and and you know, I, I think that with with things becoming so online, mm -hmm. I think that having a space, especially in a city like New Orleans, that's so kind of outside of the outside of the technology mainstream, where we kind of like doing things on paper. Um, I think yeah. I think ha having a space where people who are sort of typing those manuscripts could come and and connect and talk about it would would be a welcome thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing that I want to say about the box, because you spoke about the, but that concept of giving it away, doing that thing, like you say, if you do a sequel, you know, hopefully the people will come back. That's what this guy argues, right? And the thing is this, okay, I, from experience, if you, if you go through a publisher, I mean, you all think it's nothing, I mean, compared to what everybody else gets. I mean, if I were to go with a percentage of what, in other words, the, the book sells for X, okay, the percentage of that to X that I get is just absolutely absurd, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, just it is. But, so, if you have your own book, though, yeah. and it catches on, I mean, you really could, you know, do well. Right. So, so, I mean, so the future, I think, is, you know, I mean, I mean, things are changing so quickly with the internet, with, with newspapers yeah. and publishing and everything, I mean, you know, literary. Well, I think the whole Fifty Shades of Grey lady started out, you know, in some ways like this and got picked up big time. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's your books? <laughs> That's the sequel. <laughs> That would that would move. You need lots of copies oh, before wow. some holiday. I don't know. Fifty shades of yellow. But you do learn. <laughs> you never read the book. You do learn the first time you publish it that you may have thought, no matter how naive or how uh, wizened you are to this, that a publisher actually does something for you other than write the book. Yeah. And it turns out, you know. Um, 99% of the sales are what you do. I mean, your experience of selling 450 is well, yeah. almost, you know, unusual compared to the total. Because a lot of it is how much you're willing to get out there and haul those books and sell them. So sure. yeah. eventually, after you do it the first time, you realize, well, if I'm going to do that, exactly why am I not publishing well, it? If, well, if I can do as good a job publishing, maybe I should do that. But. Well, on that note, okay, I want to go on record as saying that Bill Lavender at Lavender Inc. did a, did a great job. Uh, they're putting this together. And yeah, there's a beautiful little book. It's, it's, really, it's, a, it's a great package to put together yes. so for what it's worth. So I'm, I'm yeah. grateful to that. Good good that. And I probably wouldn't have been able to do it without him the way he did it at this point. I'm not going to do it. Right. So I'm, I'm not, you know, not, I didn't want to take a swipe and feel he's big. And, no, that's not. And I heard about it, so he did a good job promoting it. Well, and, <laughs> yeah, uh, somehow you yeah. lit lightning struck for you, and that's and, what uh, you want to happen. And, uh, well, right. Well, it was a rubber coated lightning. But <laughs> but I think Christie's experience really resonates for, uh, I mean, yours almost is the exception um, in terms of really finding a market niche, it, it hits, yeah. if he yeah. had them there, you might have been as easily sold 5,000 as 1,500, but the long and short of it is, what Christie's doing is very interesting. Absolutely. You lose no money. I mean, if you Especially all of a sudden, on demand, ordered, you know, 500 of these to sit in your, you know, attic or shed or whatever, well, you might, you know, have some trouble moving those, but, yeah. and, you know, lots of 20 or lots of 50, you're going to, you know, you're going to sell what you do, and then whatever you move on Kindle, if you can get sort of the buzz out there, you sell them for 99 cents, you sell them for $2, that's, most of that's yours, right? right. 
So you may not be making, you know, big hundred dollar a month royalty checks, but whatever you make is what you make. Yeah. And the more you, that was the story about Amanda Hawking. She just had, every three months she was putting out another book and she had such a following that people were even mm -hmm. complaining that it was awful grammar. No one was editing these yeah. books, or, but they were buying them up. And I mean, just in multitudes, you know, thousands and thousands of people buying these books and it starts adding up over time. You, well, you, you know, this, is, well, this is off the subject, but I want to say something about what you said before about how you actually wrote the book, which I think is important if it's just about who actually wants to write a book that you put a schedule down and you stuck to it and you did it every day. Yeah. Because you, you, you'd be amazed at what you can do in a short period of time if you just do it every day. Right. And don't you know, skip or whatever. And don't let yourself stop. Right. Because you can really accomplish something actually. And, uh, you know, just this little discipline. And once you, get, you know, and once you start to, like, it's like a diet. You know, once you start it for like a week, you know, you, you almost have like a biological pull that yeah. you have to do it. You get addicted to it. Yeah. Well, I, I think you have to have a production part. You got to have a you know, my own view of in writing is you. Once you sit down, there's got to be a minimum number you're going to produce before you say that's the day you're right, right. So, but just to I can't do it every day, but when I do it, there's going to be a minimum number of words that gets done. But a, a, a guy told me one time, you know, just you have to sit in that spot. And he says, and even if you don't do anything that day, you went and sat in that spot, I thought about it at least. And I think that keeps you disciplined to some degree, you know. I mean, because you sit there for like, you know, 17 years, you don't get anything done. But I need something. <laughs> well, I think Christy's recommendation that you, you know, and I also do this, write it first and go back later. Mm -hmm. You can do 50, you know, drafts, but go ahead and get it done. And then you can edit back and figure out what you really want. Some of it won't make sense. Some of it you got off track and there's a rant in there. This is me talking now. <laughs> you probably don't do rants in fiction, but believe me, in nonfiction, you can get way off into the, into the weeds again. But uh, yeah, I think this is all fascinating. I'm curious if everyone's something. new projects are, like if you have anything in the works or if everyone is just sort of like taking a breather. Wait and Z won't stop emailing you or whatever. Well, uh, we're going to do a second edition of this. So I've, I've been compiling a few things and taking uh, uh, you know, suggestions. I haven't, got that, I haven't got that many suggestions, really. And uh, we're going to start doing that in April. In, in, you know, uh, and uh, so that's that's one thing, and I'm trying to think about what I want to do next. And I've got so many ideas for Chrissy tonight, but now I, I, I really might start, start doing something. I'm thinking about what's what what would sell, you know, because I, I I like to not uh, be able to maybe quit my job after a million years. And uh, so I was thinking about I'm a, I'm a big sports fan. And I've been around since the Saints, so I was thinking about maybe doing something about the Saints. I, I do comedy, I do political satire. But I, the Saints are always good for a joke before it's sort of getting good. And, uh, so I know. Yeah. 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 You can go back there any minute. Yeah. I know. And so I have a backlog of that, but I kind of like to look at kind of like an old surrealistic, uh, satirical look at Saints history. I'm thinking about doing that, and, and you know, that's going to take a lot of research to go back. But I really want to do that at some point. Uh, I'm thinking about doing uh, something based on my uh, on my shows. So I have I have a, 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 a sketch in my shows that I do called Wait Wait Don't Kill Me. The New Orleans game show. <laughs> so, uh, I, can, I can deal with all the issue, political issues that we've done in New Orleans all these years, and I think that would be kind of an entertaining, breezy read. It kind of, and actually, it kind of, it kind of really kind of gets straight to the heart of the matter in uh, some of the buffoonery around here, you know. So I kind of like to do that, uh, and I've got a couple of other things. But I have, I have a movie script that I've done with a friend of mine. Actually, it's another thing that goes on down here. It's movie scripts. I have a movie script that a friend of mine did based on my characters I'm doing my shows. It's a New Orleans thing. We've, we've got a script now. We're trying to show it in everybody's face. There's nothing to do with the movies. And uh, so that's what I've been doing too. So if anybody has any connections to the movie industry, please let me know. Of course, that's another aspect is, is the movie industry here. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and Chris uh, has also been after us to help him with a part of his uh, a segment of his show called uh, Disgruntled Emails to a Coffee Shop. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm working on some radio shows that people are trying to put together in town of comedy, and I was, I'm sitting back there. I've actually, I, I wrote one about somebody ordering coffee, one of the sketches. And I've also I have some, heard some people complaining about you know, people they complain about everything on earth. You know, I mean, I, I, mean, I complain about everything. Well, you, I mean, I'm a comedian, so you have to be like, negative. But it's like, God almighty, I mean, people are just so whatever. I mean, oh my God, I mean, it's unbelievable. 
the dude with the phone. Like sitcom, you know, called the Fairgrounds Coffee House. Uh, yeah, you do that one. I'll yeah, do we'll, we'll, we'll do it. And we'll help. <laughs> I have one more serious question for all three of you, and then, you know, we'll probably just break up and let people visit and go or whatever. So, promoting French Truck or your books through social media, Facebook, Twitter, any of it work? You do this, you don't do it? Is it waste? I know you have a website. Yeah. Is this uh, working out for y'all? Well, I will say that my company would not be able to exist, would not exist 10 years ago. Um, and that primarily has to do with Facebook, Twitter, and the iPhone. And that the iPhone, why the iPhone? Because there are apps that let me deal with finances. Oh, okay, there's an app for that. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I can pick up a check from a, a, a customer and take a picture of it and deposit it in the bank. I can email an invoice with my thumb. Um, and that's all stuff that I wouldn't have been able to afford if it had to be a person or a position in my company. And it would have been 10 years ago. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to afford the advertising that Facebook has afforded me or Twitter has afforded me. Do people order from you on Facebook? No, but I do have a website. Right. Um, so they, and it steers Facebook people. likes yeah. into the website. We actually yeah. order from him on the iPhone. Yeah. My iPhone orders from his iPhone. So. <laughs> yeah, but we pay him old school. The U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> I'm sure he's very keep it to it it on together. <laughs> I know that handwriting and I see it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I also have you know, several people in my office that know exactly how to write that scribble scratch. So you never know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a secret we don't tell. But. And Christy, how, did, you, you, how, did you use any of that to promote? Uh, you know, I haven't used a lot of social media for this. It, it was kind of a labor of love for me and then just an experiment to see how it sells on its own. I haven't, and part of it was obviously to shut your family up, from what we can tell. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> To answer both of y'all's questions, kind of my next project, um, so I do have two kids and two boys. They're four and two, and they are a lot of them death, but they're very wild. And we have to get them out of the house all the time. So we start taking trips every weekend, and I started writing a blog about it called Getting Lost in Louisiana. And I pitched it to Country Roads Magazine, and they picked it up, and they send it out every Thursday through their e-newsletter. Well, I have about uh, 50 blogs now that I've written along the way. And we have about five more trips we want to take in. We want to um, try and turn it into a book, a uh, travel log of South Louisiana, family traveling along Louisiana. And so in anticipation of that, I started a Facebook site, Getting Lost in Louisiana. And I thought, well, I'll just leave it alone for a few days. And I got about 30 followers, whatever, you know, not many, mostly family <laughs> following. And then my husband discovered the wonders of Facebook advertising. And for $5 a day, I do it on Thursday and Sunday. And I'm up to over 1,600 followers in just, just a month I've gotten wow. from doing. So it's not a lot of money, and it's really amazing that you get about 50 a day every time you do it. Wow. Those are well, you know, I'm, I'm interested in that, too, because I just, I'm, I'm so you know, media savvy. And, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I saw this thing, $7, you know, I'm thinking to myself, hmm. Seven dollars. I can afford seven dollars. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if that would work. So I, mean, I, I have I had a show. I started a new show last night, and and uh, you know I had the the event on Facebook, and it, it I, you know it, it does help you to get to get the word out for sure. And uh, so I'm, I'm thinking about you know, what the hell, you know. I mean, I spend more yeah. than on keynotes. Well, you right. sell one extra ticket to yeah. a show. Yeah. It's, Sure, it's hard, yeah. Well, and there may be some New York Times left on the counter, but there's actually an article about the Facebook advertising today and whether or not Facebook is essentially uh, putting its hand, stacking the deck on its algorithm to push people to you when you advertise as opposed to when you don't. Oh, yeah, no, Yelp does that. They won't publish their algorithm. Yelp, uh, Yelp Well, not on public, sorry, right? yeah. Uh, Yelp is getting in trouble for blackmailing people, saying, you're getting a lot of attention on our site, do you want to advertise with us? And then if you say no, they, they only publish your bad advertising. Yeah, but the Gambit right? does that too. Like, yeah. Cardi does that, so. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for your positive outlook. <laughs> yeah. One more positive thing. One of the things, this book that I recommended here, says if you're going to sell a book, ebook on Amazon, it's incredibly important how you design the cover. So how did you get the cover designed? 
O-L. Which is very distinctive. Very yeah, fine. Which very nice. sing, fine to sing Johnny. And this is my second cover. I had done the first one myself. Uh, my husband took the picture, and I just put it in Photoshop, turned it to sepia. And I sold a fair amount of copies. I mean, not that many. But then my husband's also in public relations, and he knows a really good graphic designer. And he asked her to go redesign the cover because he hated the one I had before, which I was offended because I had made it, but whatever. <laughs> redesign. No, yeah, it's too late. It's too late to go back at that point, I but I understand. Put it back up on Amazon, printed it, and then that's when, it, and I think it did make a difference because that first time, it was during Christmas, people were buying a lot of books, and I had people download 1,100 copies in five days. This time, I did it three days in just a nondescript time, not a big and it was uh, 1800 copies. Yeah, well, what, what this guy, particularly this APE guy, said is it's worth it to hire an editor because, you know, your own friend and your English teacher and your grammar really doesn't get right. it all. Uh, an editor does make a difference and the graphic design is extremely important. So if you spend any money at all mm -hmm. on, uh, you yeah. know, artisanal publishing, you want to do those two things. Right, wrong, I don't know, but it's a distinctive cover. Jeffrey, this how did you get your um, logo? There's a uh, website called CrowdSpring, and you put your idea up and a little blurb about your company and what you're trying to do, and you get um, submissions from graphic designers all over the world. And you say what you're going to pay before you put it up. Yeah, and you tell them, this is what I'm willing to pay, and, and then that it. decides who I, I, what I, I actually read pay. about that, so okay. Yeah, that's, what, that, that's how this came about. And, um, and how much did it cost you? Five hundred dollars. Is this yours now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, it's all yeah, yours. And I've got it trademarked, and it's U.S. Anybody in the U.S. tries to use this, and I can send them a letter of cease and desist. That was expensive, and yeah. it was worth it. There are <laughs> yeah. two things that I spent a bunch of money on that most people thought I was crazy, and it was this and the truck. Mm. But. Yeah. And you say that and, and the, the truck, truck is more out. famous now than. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I get there, if you go and Google French truck, there's all kinds of Tumblr pictures and uh, just the truck, you know, tourists that are in town and they just, oh, look. Yeah. So it's it's paid for itself many it's times over a red. Like, yeah. yeah. well, I mean, every great idea, every bad choice you've won't work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know. And, and sometimes they're right. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> often they're wrong. You know, yeah, yeah, no, you got to go with the odds. I mean, it depends what you believe in, but before I forget, I have another book, okay, it's called, uh, called Roach Opera, uh, which is a book of moms. It's uh, been sold stuff. for years, too, yeah. I think, yeah. yes. But, uh, so maybe I should republish that. Then. Well, well you hear what I'm saying, that, you can get that picture of the roach on front, that's going to be key. So <laughs> well, I'm going to wait for Christmas Caponero before you... Uh, yeah. No, I've, I've actually seen the cover sitting around the house. The cover's great. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fabulous cover by Money Matthews. So I'm lucky. Oh, okay. I'm trading uh, money and... Uh, well, bartering is still very important. Well, this is this has been so much, such fun. I know I enjoyed it, and it'll be great on YouTube. And you know, you never know. But this is fantastic. Anybody else got a final thing? Because we're I like to run these things until eight thirty. Boom. That's one of the things you learn as a professional organizer is when it goes past about an hour and a half. You just never know what's going to happen, and I've seen it go well and poorly and whatever. So I like to end it just I'm on time. Angry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 well, it turns out it's that ninety-minute thing. You know, it's just uh, this is great. Anything else? Okay. Any other Thank announcements so we much. have? I appreciate everyone being super flexible with us and allowing us to twist your arm. Several of you actually yeah. twist your arms to come. So Yeah, we got so many, I won't do it, I won't do it, I won't do it, until all of a sudden she did it. Yep. <laughs> we are trying to do another thing that people uh, you know, should know about. I think it's the fourth Wednesday of every month we're trying a thing, which is also a discussion, a little more about politics, informal, outside when we have good weather, and that's a uh, thing called Drinking Liberally, which is a club that was started some years ago. We had our first 10 people here last week. We're just, Z and I are just opening up our whole social life. I mean, he's not yeah, that many. Just, I, we're I so I, busy now. I do now there's two things a month I have to do. Uh, and any good ideas, spread the word about uh, these dialogues. And, and Chris, you, you, you've got to come to Drinking Liberally. It was so serious. Last week it was, it was so serious. It was new. Okay. <laughs> so, do you drink coffee? Well, 
We drink so, all kinds of things. People drink coffee. <laughs> we uh, we had uh, fire uh, fat tire, which is a beer from Colorado that they don't sell down here. That uh, okay, I was stuck in, in Katrina. I was actually in Denver. You couldn't have been higher. And uh, since I couldn't get home for forty, you know, I forget forty eight days, whatever it was. That uh, next day, I ended up having fat tire and buffalo burger at a place in Denver and. <laughs> Whatever this fat tire was, I really started liking it. So yeah. now I pick it up in either Texas or uh, Arkansas and bring it down. So we did we have someone uh, threaten to leave because we didn't have any bourbon, so we won't make that mistake again. <laughs> Anyone's concerned? Well, and we have a special kind of bourbon we're bringing in from Waco, Texas, but they keep selling out in Houston. This, these folks won a big award for it. Yeah. It's a little thing called Marones, which is what the fault line is called there between Waco and Austin. So, yeah. Mm. So, uh, you know, there's some, ex you know, little eccentricities that are involved in this that aren't part of the core program. So, yeah, this is now, the now, now I feel like a Jeff, really. you, know, like a big, you know, expert on this, which I am not. I used to kid me about being a beer of the year guy. Uh, but now we're just wild on this thing. But it's a good excuse for people to get together and talk. And, I'm actually in Arkansas the next time, so Z, I'm, I'm to warn you, this is going to be Z. It's going to be Z. crazy. Yeah, it's going to be wild. <laughs> I get my drawers are coming. The cops are going to come.